Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the San Fernando City Hall. We're about to start the proceedings, so uh, as we're about to get underway, kindly ensure if you have any mobile devices with you that they are on a silent mode or at least will not be a disturbance during the proceedings this afternoon, especially as the contributions for this session will be recorded uh, for the purpose of being able to share with the national community. Thank you for your cooperation. Will you please stand for the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, followed by a prayer. Dr. Farrell to lead us in prayer. Almighty God, giver of all good things, look with favor upon all of us gathered here this evening. Show us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in the consultation with the people of San Fernando and environs for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us safely back to our homes and our families. Amen. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. Please be seated. Before we start formally, permit me to request your attention for the safety procedures here at uh, the City Hall. Your attention, please. Thank, thank you very much. Permit me to start by welcoming all those who've just arrived. By all means, please come forward. Absolutely happy to have you there with, here with us. Permit me to acknowledge uh, this evening, Your Worship, the Mayor of the City of San Fernando, Councillor Robert Paris, pleasure to be with you, and all other officers of the San Fernando City Corporation, the Chair of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, Mr. Barindra Sinanan, Committee Chair and former Speaker of the House. Other members of the National Advisory Committee, including Dr. Terence Farrell, Attorney at Law and former Central Bank Deputy Governor. Mr. Nizam Hamid, Attorney at Law and former Speaker of the House. We recognize in absentia Ms. Helen Drayton, as well as Heman Orion Singh, Consulting Managing Partner of EY. Mr. Winston Rudder, Public Service Commission Chair and former PS in the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, Ms. Jacqueline Sampson Miguel, Attorney at Law and former Clerk of the House, and Mr. Ray Sandy, former Tobago House of Assembly Chief Administrator. Good evening. I'm your Master of Ceremonies, Wendell Constantine. It's a pleasure to be in the city of San Fernando yet again. And welcome to yet another edition of the consultations with the community on behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. Without any further ado, permit me to invite to bid you welcome and deliver brief remarks, the committee chair and former speaker of the house, Mr. Barindra Sinanad. Please welcome him. Thank you. 
Your Worship, the Mayor of the City of San Fernando, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, I am pleased to welcome you to this, our special meeting. It is a meeting where you can share your ideas, views, and recommendations for reforming the Constitution. The Constitution is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights, ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide its future development in the interests of the welfare, prosperity, and happiness of citizens. My committee is ensuring that you, the citizens, are at the forefront and center of any reform initiative, which is why we are here today. Constitutional reform is a complex and lengthy process, not just in our country, but worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts, which only reinforce the need for our collective, persistent and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generations. I express my sincere gratitude for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters. And we are here to listen. Now, before I take my seat, I want to just quote from you parts of the mandate given to this committee. The National Advisory Committee shall incorporate within its proposed terms of reference outline parameters of subject matter for national debate and for the engagement of the widest cross-section of persons and bodies representing the citizenry, including the diaspora, political parties, NGOs, commercial interests, religious interests, labor and trade union interests, educators and students, with a view to promoting meaningful consultation, debate and engagement in the offering and exchange of options and the making of recommendations for constitutional reform for Trinidad and Tobago. The committee will be required to initiate, consult widely and guide the national debate towards the generation of package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June 2024. I want to thank you sincerely for being here today and we look forward to your involved and meaningful contribution. I would now ask Dr. Farrell to expand on um, the work of the, the committee thus far. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Chairman. Uh, this, this is the fifth time since the 1976 Constitution was put in place that we have been attempting constitutional reform, the fifth time. Uh, the, the Wooden Commission, which uh, worked from 1972 to 1974 and, 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 and did its work against the backdrop of the Black Power uh, Revolution in 1970, states of emergency, uh, uh, uprising, and social unrest, did his work 1970-1974, produced an excellent document. Uh, and all of those documents, by the way, are on our website. But which did not find favor with the then Prime Minister, Eric Williams, who essentially took that report and put it in a drawer and had someone else draft the 1976 Constitution. Obviously, some things from the Wooding Report were taken and put into the 76 Constitution. For example, they moved from a governor general to a president that made us into a republic. <clears throat> but in essence, the 1976 Constitution, which we have today, is the same as the 
1962 Independence Constitution. And it's important to remember that that constitution was done rather hurriedly following the breakup of the Federation in 1961 when Jamaica withdrew and both Jamaica and Trinidad accelerated the move towards independence. Constitution was hurriedly done uh, with the blessings of the British as an order in council. The 1976 constitution, which we have today in large measure, because we have made no significant amendments to that constitution, is therefore in effect the constitution which was given to us by the British in 1962. So we are operating with a 1962 constitution. <clears throat> but it's worse than that, because the, many of the institutions which we have, which were put in place in the 62 constitution, the independence constitution, were established by the British for us, for example, the service commissions in the 1950s. And we are operating those institutions today. Now, as I said, this is the fifth time we are, do we are doing this exercise as a country. Very shortly after 76, the Hayatali Commission was set up under the NAR regime in 1987-88 and engaged, again, in a process of, just like the Wooden Commission, of looking at constitutional reform. That exercise was essentially aborted by the 1990 attempted coup, and the NAR went out of office, and that was that. The Manning administration, 91 to 95, did really nothing. It was only four years. The Pandey administration did not have an exercise on constitutional reform, but the Pandey administration made some significant pieces of legislation. The Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act, the Integrity and Public Life Act, all of which have had significant constitutional implications. But that desire or that need for, for constitutional reform remained. And a group of businessmen, interestingly, not government, a group of businessmen called the Principles of Fairness Committee in 2006 drafted a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago, a group of businessmen. Around that time as well, there was a group called the Constitutional Reform Forum, which was led by Dennis Pantin out of the University of the West Indies, attempting and agitating for constitutional reform. The Manning administration, seeing what the Principles of Fairness Committee had done, commissioned Ellis Clark to do a draft constitution, when, which was done in 2009, the fourth attempt. And then the UNC People's Partnership Administration in 2013 had the Ramada Committee, which also went out, engaged in public consultations, and did a report on constitutional reform. This is the fifth time we are doing it. Now, I, I, I think that one could say that we, 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 we're spinning top in mud, it looks like that. But, 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 but what it says is that there is a need for constitutional reform. What, what these attempts by different political administrations over the course of the last 50 years, it seems to me, is saying there is a need for reform. That the institutions <clears throat> which the Constitution has set up are, in effect, colonial institutions, which we are trying to make work in the 21st century. They were not fit for purpose then in 1976, and they are even worse, in my view, now, today. So we are engaged in this exercise, and this exercise is, uh, we have considerable advantages compared to, to uh, Wooding and his team. They had no internet, they had no email. There was one television station operating in Trinidad in the 1970s, TTT. Today we have much more advantages in terms of reaching people, and I can tell you that as of today, because today is actually the deadline for the submissions to the committee, via uh, the website and by email, we have received hundreds of submissions from the public via email, via the website. But we've also embarked on these consultations throughout the country to all 14 regional corporations and to Tobago because we think it's also important that you have a voice, that we just you can send in an email and say we want X, Y, or Z, but these consultations, public consultations, these town hall meetings afford you the opportunity as citizens to come and articulate what you think 
uh, is needed to elaborate on some of the suggestions for reform that you may have. The, the, the one of the other things that I want to clear up, I think which Chairman was pointing out in terms of our terms of reference, uh, is that this committee is not going to draft a constitution. We, we, we are not about, that's not what we are about. What we are about is that we are gathering the views of the public, of the population. We are also importantly taking what the Wooding Report said, what the High Tally Commission Report said, what the Principles of Fairness Committee said, what the Ellis Clark Draft said, what the Ramadan Committee Report said. We are taking all of that into consideration in putting together our thoughts and our ideas, together with what we are getting from you, the public, today, putting that together in terms of the report that is going to go forward to the cabinet. And from there, it's a question of uh, having some kind of convention, constitutional convention. I prefer to call it a constituent assembly where the public can indicate what it would want to see in terms of a new constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. So that's the background to it, and it's now hearing your voice in terms of what you would like to see in a new constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. Well, if we are to reflect for those who may have just arrived, um, my grandmother would have said many years ago, Rome was not built in a day. One of my deans and a sports captain at college always used to remind parents when they came to the school that statement that you utter, when I was your age, and he would always verify and validate, but you were never your son or daughter's age in 2024. Times change, and it's good that the feedback that we have been receiving for the last five meetings that we've had permit persons from all walks of life and all sectors in our society and all corners of our twin island republic to make their contribution in fora such as this. You have the wisdom of the committee present with you, not to shape your opinion, but to provide you with context. Those who've been in the public sector, those who've been in the private sector, those who have been in the financial areas of our country, those who have sat in the corridors of the decision-making for our constituencies as speakers of the House of Representatives, etc. To date, we've been to, and let me just share, Sangre Grande, Point Fortin, Port of Spain to facilitate Port of Spain and Diego Martin, Mayaro Rio Claro, most recently Tobago East, and this evening, San Fernando. Yet to come, Princess Town, Arima, Tobago West, Chaguanas, Pinal de Beceparia, and Tunapuna, Laventil, San Juan. As well as Cuva, Talparo, Tabakit. So just so that you're aware, the listening will continue for a while longer, leading up to the June national conference. And even then, no constitution will be written. It will really be an opportunity for all that has been received throughout the nation via email and then at that public constitution to distill and find commonality, integration, similarity, and some level of decision thereafter. And even then, a constitution would not be written because the process to write the constitution will be unique for us as a country in the 2024, 2025, 2026 period with all that's taking place in our society. And even what is written is really not so much intended for us right in this moment of April 2024, but for those who will come 
in the 2030s, the 2040s, the 2050s. We must write for the future. We must plan not for where we are, but where we desire to be. And together we aspire, together we will achieve. This evening, my job is very simple. We started on time, and we'll end on time, which is at 8.30 p.m. And to facilitate all who are with us this evening, the time for your contributions is just on five minutes. Now, I'm a very polite person. So you will cooperate with me because I will allow you your five minutes. However, once I make my way from that chair to this podium, it's an indication that your five minutes has already gone and that you should bring your point to a conclusion. Thereafter, if additional time is needed, it can be afforded once we've allowed everyone who wishes to make a contribution to so do. So it's not that you're just stymied after five minutes, there can be another opportunity, providing, of course, we've facilitated everyone who is with us that wishes to make a contribution. So we have a good cooperation and agreement? Praise the Lord. Oh, no, that's not the purpose. It's for us to listen to what everyone has to say. So those who wish to make a contribution... Those who wish to make a contribution, you are free to do so from here on in. And all that you need to do is make your way to the microphones that are available and indicate name. If you want to say what part of South you're from, by all means you may. Gentlemen, you're on your, foot, so your feet. So, sir, you have the opportunity to please come forward right away. The floor is yours. Very well. Okay. Go right ahead. And I think, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening to you. I'm Mickey Matthews. I have, I don't know if you know me, but since, uh, since the Wooden Commission, I've attended almost every exercise and constitution reform. Lovely to have you. And I can tell you a lot about it. Yeah. And I, this business about people speak, of speaking in meetings, I think needs some clarity. I don't think people come to me, the vast majority of people come here, come to speak at all. They come here in search of somebody who can speak for them. And that is exactly what the constitution exercise is about. Because everybody can't go into parliament. They say that um, every cook, cook can govern, but everybody don't have the time to cook. Some have to work, see about their children and so on. And I come here this evening, and if there's someone who could speak for me, who could say what I have in my heart, I will sit down and listen. So this thing about five minutes on a question of constitution reform is out of the question. I think the time limit should de be dictated by democratic sanction from the floor. If you could hold the floor, you speak. If you can, then you take your chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's for now. Thank you for your contribution. And we continue. So those who are with us, by all means, make your way to the microphones, either front or uh, mid midpoint. And once you're there, we'll alternate accordingly so that we can facilitate all the contributions. So you've made your way to the microphone. Good evening and welcome your name, please. Uh, pleasant evening to Mr. Chairperson, to his worship, the mayor, to the head table, and permit me to point out the former Speaker of the House, Haji Nizam Mohammed. All protocol been observed at this time. My name is Dumorius Horsley, Welcome. National Awardee. Welcome. Thank you. Quite simple. So what we're hearing here, we have 41 corporation together with City Corporation. My suggestion, we have 41 constituencies. And I'm saying the Constitution hits home to the heart of the people. Yes, we understand there is a lot of, in terms of email, WhatsApp, Facebook, and all these things. But I'm saying if we want to speak 
to rural community, which my life and time is rural community. And I'm saying there is a lot of people who do not have devices. And if we really want to deal with the heart of the Constitution, let's take it to the 41 constituencies. And in the 41 constituencies, we want to go in two areas in these constituencies. I understand time constraint. I understand protocol and diplomacy. But if we're really talking to really meet that common man, Bouji, uncle, tante, who may not have a device, but really want to take a maxi and come forward in that community, yes, this session is good, but I'm saying please to the head table, let's extend this to 41 constituencies. I take my leave until later. I respect your ruling, Mr. Chairperson. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Horsley. So you have the microphone. It's all yours by all means. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. My name is Barry Garcia and I'm from, originally from Separia and I'm, I live in San Fernando. I want to first recognize Mr. Sinanan, Dr. Farrell, Ms. Jackie, and Mr. Nizam Mohammed, the other two gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening to you. Constitutional reform is a very serious, very serious undertaking. And I was not a wrong, I was a student in the 70s, so I may not have understood what the Hugh Wooden Commission brought to the table. But I was there for the higher tally and all the rest. And I think that the government that come, government that go, is dragging their feet on constitutional reform. They don't want constitutional reform because it will affect some of their urgencies. For instance, for example, we have a number of state enterprises in the country. But the state enterprises reports only to the parliament. But who put the state enterprises there? And who put the parliamentarians there? It is the people. When you have one side in government and the state enterprise goes before the committees, the oversight committees, the one, the government side protects them and the opposition side attacks them. And then you have an exercise in futility. It reaches no consensus, nothing is achieved, and everybody go back to bed Fine, fine and dandy. What I am suggesting to the committee, and suggesting for all here, because I feel other people may have had the same thought process as me, is that the special poop, those special purpose comp companies, come to the public, report to the public. You report to the fourteen regional corporations. Each one of them report to the fourteen regional corporations where they can face scrutiny from the public because it is the public's purse you are dealing with. It is the public's energy that puts you there. It is the public that also puts the members of parliaments there. Regardless of who you support, you put them there. And you put them there for the purpose of seeking your interests, not self-interest. Okay? And also, they have 41 members of parliament. We must put into the constitution that there must be re a recall system. Once a member of parliament is not performing, the constituency has the right to recall him and hold him before them. Two, senators, it is time we grow up. Senators must not be selected. Senators must come and face the poll. And for that to happen, we must have an executive president. The election could be twofold. The election is elect the members of parliament first, and then sometime later, you elect the senators. Senators go on the hostings, present their case to the public population, and the population elect them to go and serve on their behalf. This thing that you are taking members of parliament 
and giving them cabinet positions, that is outdated. That is antiquated. You need to have a system where you can take the brightest and the best from the public and put them as cabinet ministers. And the MPs is to stay and see about their constituents. We can't have MPs having portfolios and then when, come, when time come to service the constituencies, they are burnt out. Because to run a ministry is not an easy task. There are many, many complications that are involved in running a ministry. Okay? So therefore, you have the MP there. He applies to the department for funds to do something, and that funds must be given within 21 days so that the MP can service his constituency. And last but not least, because I want other persons to make their contribution, the police service. I come from the police background. I spent 33 years in the police service. 33 years. I work all about. I work intelligence all about. So I know many things. The police service, the police commissioner and deputy commissioners must be elected by the people. The police must come, the person wishing to be a police commissioner that have the creden credentials must come and face scrutiny from the public. And then the public will decide, we will make you the commissioner of police. Because you can't have a police service continue to run, and I've been saying that for over the years, where you have members of the service coming up in rank, but their only interest is self-interest. Very few senior officers in the police service put their foot on the ground and get the work done. And the public suffers at large. So I believe to hold the police commissioner accountable, the police commissioner must be able to face scrutiny from the public. And that is my contribution. So I would, for the time being, I will make room for others to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. The gentleman that is in the middle of the room, good evening, sir. Your contribution, welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols we observe and to the head table. I think for the last... Please just help us with your name, please. Kenrick Allen. Kenrick? Allen. Allen. From good. San Fernando. Welcome, sir. Thank you. For the last 25 years, there is always an issue coming up with the Constitution. For example, when Pandey wanted to appoint the seven losers, and different people give different interpretation. I feel in this modern era, we need a new constitution to be rewritten for the 21st century. The piecemeal, patch here and patch there, and then the law is in a kind of pause. It's not ascended to the president, to be proclaimed law. It's not serving us properly. I believe that in the Constitution, a referendum should be inserted. For example, do we want the Privy Council, yes or no? Let the people decide. Do we want the death penalty, yes or no? Let the people decide. And you have ministries not performing and they're answerable to nobody. For example, I was just listening to a radio program there before I came to this meeting with Petra Train and the AV oil issue and so on and so forth. And when you listen to Ramesh Lawrence Mirage, Deborah Peak in her statement was clearly misleading Rowley, saying to challenge it. What I would like to know where in the world an arbitration ruling was challenged and it was successful. I feel it's time 
because we live in a new era. The Constitution needs to reflect. And if we go for the CCJ, I believe justice would be cheaper, more affordable to the smaller man. There's more to be said, but I would submit it in a report, seeing that we are constrained with time, five minutes. I thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Your mic is on. Welcome. Welcome to the panel. Yeah, good evening. Chairperson, the um, distinguished mayor and panel. My name is Stacey Cadogan. I am speaking on authority of the Unified Health Sector Workers Union. Um, on, with, with permission from the president, Mr. Andy Acosta, and the general secretary, Mrs. Ria San John Acosta. I'm here seeking constitutional reform with regards to the recognized majority union status. And I'll state the two recommendations first, and I'm quite happy that the chairperson said, together we aspire, together we achieve. Because if we don't aspire towards something, we can achieve nothing. And I am hoping that I have the air of the panel as I present my case. I presented the document online for further, because it will definitely take more than five minutes. So I submitted the document with the required acts, the Trade Union Act, the Industrial Relations Act, the Equal Opportunity Act, as well as the Trade Union Act. Okay, what I'm seeking is, we rather, the members of the Unified Health Sector Workers Union, we represent healthcare workers. Okay, we are seeking the, that the RHA system be abolished in preference of the Ministry of Health System. Also the abolition of the RMU requirement for collective agreement. And I want to remind our guests here that our constitution sets out to define the structure, authorities, and duties of governmental offices and the limits of their powers, which means like a tree, it's better to bend than to break. Rules are meant to be, you know, looked at. We are meant, I mean, as we grow, we improve, and we are hoping for improvements in the system. It's flawed in many ways, and I highlighted it when I submitted the documents. It does not really and truly represent or at least seek the interest of workers at heart. There's no, bar there's no collective bargaining power, okay? And I just wanted to highlight a few points that at least a the percentage of workers in a union is approximately 23%. To achieve the RMU status, we must have 50% plus one. We know the extent of the healthcare service. We know that the figures and the maths makes this quite elusive. This is why I'm seeking your intervention. Additionally, there are powers that states, and I'm reading from the IR Act, section 36, nothing in this part shall be construed so as to permit the certification of more than one union as the RMU of workers comprising a bargaining unit. Healthcare workers have multiple unions, all right? And I am passionate about this because just like myself, the general secretary did the mathematics. And realizing that it seems elusive with the, with the exception of the approval of the panel, she reached out to the other unions. I don't want to call them by name, but we know the unions. No one was interested to seek this collaboration to ensure workers are treated equally, equal under the Equal Opportunity Act. You have daily paid workers getting a different bargaining power to the monthly paid workers. I'm seeking this because in the reign of the deceased Mr. Pandey, the empath was formed and they were given this status without these special considerations that we are here seeking, and it's only fair. Also, the daily paid and the empath workers were given this consideration, but when Ms. Je then President Jennifer Patisse Primus presented for the monthly paid workers, it was rejected. The act simply does not allow for a basic thing like study leave. How could a daily paid employee get study leave, but not a monthly paid employee, right? Then there is this big, you know, you're going to create tensions in the workplace. I mean, if you listen to Richard, Br Sir Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin Airlines, he says he believes a happy workforce, a healthy workforce is going to deliver. And we are all too familiar with complaints about the healthcare system and complaints about the nurses. But at the end of the day, from where I sat, 
Okay, previously I didn't have the most favorable of views, but when I sat as the research and education officer and I started to research and I educated myself, I realized that some of these people are working under some really heartbreaking conditions. There is nothing in place to bargain for them, to seek their interests. It goes even against the Constitution, right? The, a cardinal point to this rule under Section 39 states, it's the, the government has the necessity to maintain and improve the standard of living of workers and the need to ensure the continued ability of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to finance developmental programs in the public sector, and the court can take such matters into consideration. How can they take matters into consideration if there's nothing in the policy? Additionally, unions will get a lot of um, defeats at the courts where matters of policy are concerned because there's not, even though there is a harsh and oppressive condition, even though there is a genuine vested interest that another worker with, under RMU will be entitled to, a member not under the RMU suffers because this piece of legislation prevents the course and courage of justice. Hence the reason I submitted three documents. The Industrial Relations Act, the Trade Unions Act, which the RMU prevents us from effectively delivering on, as well as the Equal Opportunity Act, which if you were to read, right, it is a direct, um, it just doesn't happen. It, is a, it, it doesn't happen. So how could this thing enshrined in law prevent workers from being um, under a collective agreement where they can benefit, where they have a voice, where in accordance with the Equal Opportunity Act, they are equal under the law, where in accordance with the Industrial Relations Act, they are able to benefit by the benefits other workers achieve. Let's take MPAT. They got a special condition. Can we not look at a special condition? for these people to have a voice. If I may, I have very quickly about five points that affect, now it's bullet points, Go right? Ahead. I want them to understand. In the healthcare system, because of this lack of policy, there are breaches in the OSH Act and workers are continuously forced to walk off the job. Not so, particularly at staff clinic and what have you. Then there are memorandum changes. Every Monday morning a memo comes out, there's a change in policy, there's a change in policy, but there's nothing to be guided by in the absence of a collective bargaining document. Additionally, well, there are serious allegations of nepotism and cronyism, discrepancies in the award of employment contracts. You're gonna hear these stories. Somebody gets a year, somebody gets three years. Some people go month to month. This ought not to be contravenes, it contradicts, it's obscene against the Equal Opportunity Act. Additionally, there are memorandums between the Human Resources Department and the Accounts Department that is not disseminated to the workers and the unions. So oftentimes we get a bit blindsided when something happens and then of course we don't have a leg to stand on, so what is the purpose of representation, right? The, uh, I already spoke of the study leave. I mean, if I'm working with somebody, I'm monthly paid, you're daily paid, you get to study to improve yourself. Education is a powerful tool, but I can't do it. There's also another um, issue of vacation leave, where their allowances are not paid when a worker goes on vacation. So again, I am beseeching, I am asking for consideration. We have to use empath as a point of reference. They were given the special consideration Daily paid were given the special consideration for some reason, the monthly paid, and by how it is set up, by how it is written to the letter of the law, it is an elusive goal for any of the unions in the absence of constitutional reform. Like I said, it costs us at the courts. It is enshrined in the, in the Freedom of Information Act. You can go, I have been researching for weeks, the amount of cases that this very issue costs the taxpayers. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be looked at. We need to be equal and fair under the law. Thank you for your time and thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Cadogan. <laughs> sir, good evening and welcome. Thank you very much, sir. And um, if I may be presumptuous, my name is Leonard Bradshaw. I'm welcome. from Point Fortin. Yes, sir. 
If I may be presumptuous, I have prepared a document on my recommendations for constitution reform. I have enough for each one of the members of the panel, and it may be easier for all of us if I can give you one of these so you can follow my presentation as I go from page to page. That way, I think I can confine myself to the five minutes. Am I allowed? All right, page one. I will not be superfluous. I listened to you, Dr. Farrell. My opening statement endorses everything that you said. Right? So we will not go through the opening statement. As we continue, item number one, proposals. Parliament, number of seats. I have a proposal for 20 seats in Trinidad, one in Tobago. So the Tobago House of Assembly becomes a seat equal to the 20 seats in Trinidad, that's an idea. The numbers are not cast in stone. Let us deal with the, with, with, with the philosophy. As we continue, constituencies, and here we are going to become very, very different. I am proposing that constituencies should elect a constituency governor. The constituency governor will at the same time be the representative of the constituency in the parliament. In the document, you'll find that sometimes I confuse parliament with constituency governors. Wherever you see constituency governors in parliament, it is equal, in my, opinion, in my presentation, to the, to the members of parliament as they meet and represent their interests of their constituencies. The proposal is that the constituency governors will be elected, and they will be elected on the same day as the president. I am proposing that the president should be elected by the general public. You can have two ballots on the same day, a blue ballot for your constituency governor, and that ballot refers to that particular constituency only, and a red ballot for the president, that ballot represents all of the thinking of all of Trinidad and Tobago, so the president, the president the, sorry, the contestant for presidency who gets the most red ballots becomes the president. I didn't say that well. <laughs> Constituencies, I recommend, should be funded in two ways. Mr. Garcia hinted at it. Constituencies should have an allocation of part of the national budget. So if you allocate 40% of the national budget, and don't take my figure to be cast in concrete. That will be distributed to all of the constituencies according to the number of voters in each constituency. So it's a proportional distribution of a sum that is allocated for constituency uh, expenditure. Constituencies, however, shall have the right and the privilege to seek funding from other activities. They will also have the right to seek to, to, to I'm, I'm having a, a senior moment, to seek to bring in investment in the, their constituencies from within and without Trinidad. The president, I'm proposing that we should no longer have a prime minister, but an executive president. The, I, I, I don't need to expand on that because I've read in the newspapers that a number of people have made presentations right, similar to this. Date of the elections. I think it is obscene that one individual who holds the office of prime minister should have the privilege of determining the date of the next election. There's no reason why the Constitution couldn't say, for instance, that the general election will be held on the first Monday of May every five years. You don't have to take May, choose a date, 
fix that date. It's done in the United States, it's done in Australia, it's done in a lot of other countries. Term limits, two terms for the president, two terms for each member of his cabinet. How does the president develop a cabinet? When he is elected, he comes to the constituency governors, who are the parliament, who are the people's representatives, and, I, and he says, I want John Brown to be my minister of finance. They will have the opportunity and the right to call in John Brown and interrogate him. And they can tell the president, sorry, this fellow doesn't know a dollar from a five cent, so find somebody else, please. Until the interrogation goes to the point where the constituency governors, who are the representatives of the people, say, yeah, this person is okay for a cabinet position. Cabinet members can be removed either by the president or by a three-fifths vote of all the constituency governors. Why are these pages sticking together? <laughs> Referendum. That's on the last page. I can just ad lib this. One of the problems with the Constitution now is that it can only be amended by the elected members of Parliament. You will not see a constitution change, a fundamental constitution change, if the ones who are going to be affected are going to say, yes, change the constitution. I am recommending that major decisions, especially including right, the constitution, should be done by referenda. The Senate. I'm proposing that the Senate should be appointed by NGOs, NGOs only, so that a representative group of persons who have some sort of influence in the community, in the, in, in the country, can say, I want to represent Terence Farrell as my representative on the Senate. Terence Farrell doesn't sit for five years. He sits there for as long as that group considers it wise and useful to have his contributions. So you can have 10 members of the Senate moving from one position in and out of the Senate at the, at the behest of the group that they represent. Constituency governors will not be elig eligible and I think Mr. Garcia was saying it, to be members of cabinet. They will, uh, let me repeat, constituency governors elected by the people will not be allowed to sit as cabinet members. If you take my situation, I live in Point Fortin, Kenny Richards, Kennedy Richards is my parliamentary representative. I don't think they know him in the cabinet. And why should he, who has gathered more support at the election, have less power to decide what happens in this constituency than the member of parliament for Digo Martin North Central, who is the Minister of Finance? I hope I'm not forgetting anything important. But if I have, I think I have the advantage of having given you copies of the proposals. Wendell, I think I have come nearly to the end of my presentation. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity to have made these points. Feel free to call me in at any time if you feel that any of them need to be expanded or to be explained. Because there are hidden benefits in some of the proposals, but we don't have the time to deal with that on this floor. So thank you, lady and gentlemen, for allowing me the opportunity to present. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Good evening to you, sir. The microphone is all yours. Welcome. Uh, good evening to, to all at the San Fernando West and um, the country at large. I am very happy to be here and most respects to the head table. My, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Benison Chagas. Uh, I am a former scholarship winner from the teacher training unit and um, 
researcher from the University of Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. I came across um, I came across several of the the documents that dealt or were dealing with constitutional amendments and reform and so on. I know there were several attempts to do it, and I was wondering why it wasn't done. Because I listened to one in particular, and I heard it at the, at, I think it was at point 14, uh, I think it's by Mr. Williams, he spoke about referendum. And um, the whole issue of moving the power from the representatives to the electorate, that is perhaps a reason why none of the governments ever really attempted to implement it. And that is only one area of it. My point is, uh, if we are going along that, that path, I know in 20, 2014 with the, the UNC, uh, Prakash Ramada, he, he was head of this. We did this already, you know. And I was wondering why the, 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 the government took 40 years and the UNC took 10 years and none of them either implemented any of it. And even today, they're saying, the opposition is saying, no, we're not going to take part in this. Anytime you see, you start to move the power from the, and put it back in the hands of the people, that is where the, 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 the bug lies with the, with the referendum and the amendments to it. I know you need, I think it's two thirds to get it, to get amendments or, or the constitution reformed inside the parliament. You could correct me if I'm wrong. Office. Oh, well, I know. I, I think it's two thirds in Trinidad. Okay. Well, whatever. The fact is, all these ideas coming forward are fine, but if there is not a starting point, and the will of the institutions and the the, the people who have the power to do it, it's, it's not going to be anything but just a. Uh, because I hear that for 50 years now, oh, we change the constitution, we are going to reform it, and nothing happened. Nothing. What guarantee we have going to take place now? In the eve of the election, when the, 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 the parties have the, the position or where we want power? I uh, looked through uh, Dr. Dave Saran. He wrote something in the Newsday as well yesterday, I think it was. And uh, I was even part of that whole process with the Prakash Ramada. Um, when he was Minister of Legal Affairs and so on in the last, I think with Justice also, in the last um, 2014 period. So, and they had, they had the time to do it. They got the, 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 the PNM has had a lot of time to do it. Are we going to, is this just going to be a talk show or just another, get some information? Because all these ideas coming forward has to be implemented for it to be of any value. And if, for example, we have a debt of $72 billion now, does the constitution reform going to take into consideration that? How are we going to deal with it? So there are maybe several points. The whole issue, and I will perhaps leave this, these points that I developed and research and so on. Uh, the whole issue, we talk about the referendum, and the referendum is a critical thing because in several countries they, they use it. Like in, uh, in several countries, and, you, uh, and most people know about the power of the referendum. The fixed terms for prime minister and a maximum age limit of 65 years. Yes, I call them out because. When you're 65 in Trinidad, you, you're dead. You can't get no loan, you can't get no house, you can't get nothing. But you can have a person running a $60 billion budget and telling you, hey, you can't get this. Where is that happening? Where is that happening in the world? The United States is one of the biggest democracies in the whole world, and they have two terms for, 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 for the best prime minister. Move them. They need to move. They're not there for life. 
Are they? And we as the people have the power to move them, you know. But the constitution was designed to keep you in check. Every, I listen to so many submissions here, and they're all nice, they're all fine. But do they have that power to change what we want? And the whole thing about constitution reform and, contribute, and contribution amendments. You can get about 14 or 20, I think there are 24 amendments being proposed. That is actually the whole constitution. The fixed terms for the prime minister. So you're not there for life. Right to recall non-performing ministers and MPs in the leading party and the opposition. You put somebody inside there to represent you. They're never there. You ain't seen them. They ain't even have a job spec. What's the job description from the constitution of, of, of a minister? What's the job description? How are you going to evaluate whether or not he is performing? And you stuck with them for five years, you know. You stuck with them. And I heard one young you know, a person speaking about the best brains in the country. Why they don't take the best brains in the country and use them? I, I you know, I was wondering. We have hundreds of young people coming in the system here with brilliant people coming in. A fixed, I heard you mention, mention about a fixed date for ele general election and locals with a no reform clause. So you can't go and say, I have it in your back pocket. You leave it there. Leave it right there. We, know what we, we, need, we are planning a $60 billion and they're going to raise that budget again. Eh? Because if the next parliament, if the next budget hits us and you're already in $75 billion debt and you're borrowing the next $60 billion with a $10 billion uh, excess, what going, to, what going to happen to that, that whole debt there? The people are supposed to have a right to say what, what is going on, you know. And the Constitution needs to reflect that. Have, they must have a say. They must be able to say, this is not what we want. We do not want this again. The gentleman talk about re reforming the whole uh, a new paradigm in the Constitution. But it was never, it was never um, attempted. Instead of having less people in the parliament, have more people. How many people in the English parliament? You have more interest groups. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Pandey was talking about in his constitutional reform that you need to have people who represent in different groups. This young lady talked about the, 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 um, about the, the health people and so on. Now we have a big lawsuit in the, in the, in the parliament for health. They want the minister removed, and they're taking it to court. We shouldn't have to go through those things. People, it will have more accountability, and the, and the, 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 the Constitution is supposed to remedy those things. Otherwise, the Constitution is for the people. And this is what I, I find. We always hear about people politicians have no conscience. Now, if this is the Westminster system, it have them there as the whip. Now, we need to have in the Constitution to remove the whip in some instances. It was done in, in the days of the, um, the, when the UNC and the partnership was there. And you had people voting along a conscience. Because in the parliament right now, there is no conscience. People vote like sheep along a collective responsibility, division, and they have no recourse. You might know something wrong, and you say, nah, yay, I, I go and do that. Where, 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 where is the humanity in the whole thing? And we have to bring back that the Constitution need to address that aspect of it. That you must be able to say, there is, we're going to vote. You're voting for $20 billion or a hundred million dollars on a project. And people on one side know, hey, you know this thing wrong? But they had to shut up, you know. 
They have to shut up. Because every once you whip, you, 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 if you remove the whip, then you have an open, open forum. So people from the opposition could vote with the, the government and the opposition, and the government would vote with the opposition, if it's correct. So you, you don't bridle the people into, into submission. The, the constitution is supposed to free you because it's the highest court in the land, the highest law in the land. The removal of parliamentary privileges to ensure government stick to the business of the people and not bacchanal. And people sleeping inside the parliament and all that kind of thing. What is that? Is that a joke? You know what I mean? It sounds jokey. But the, this is the, the removal of the parliamentary privileges. Every, we alone have to pay tax. And, and everybody has to pay tax. The parliamentarians have to pay tax. They gain tax-free car, tax-free house, tax-free phone. What is the difference between them and us? Now you tell me. I want a, a, a direct question, not only to the panel, but to the entire country. There's no difference. We make the difference. Huh, I don't know. I, I, my students always ask me, they say, okay, so what, what is he talking about? I say, this is what we're talking about. Removal of the privileges. Government ministers must pay taxes and the removal of all the exemptions. Equality. Equality. And the, the Malaysian model talks about sharing of the wealth. All we, my mother is 91 years, 92 years old. And you know what she's talking about? How I gonna pay pro property tax now? And the people who, who could pay property tax, not paying it. All the commercial people not paying it? Well, and they have the money? Why, why should the constitution always burden the people who cannot do something with it. And I, I agree with the gentleman here. We should vote for the president. And the mayor must be voted by the, voted by the people, cutting all political ties. To choose somebody based on, because when a person, you can't tell a person with going inside there, leading the, 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 the constituency, and you tell them, well, I, I have no political affiliation. You have to choose somebody who is neutral. Because it will be biased. How are you going to be, you can't have a biasness inside the system. You can't. So I will close on these nine points. And there are others that I see Dr. Desaran had placed in the in the um, in the news newsday, and there are quite a lot of few placed in the um, in the Prakash Ramadan report as well. And that's the thing: you, you're spending a, bi a, a, a million dollars to have something, and then you just you're just leaving it. You're just leaving it. It's like the divers: you, you, you spend. 17, billion, 17 million dollars to pay people to tell you that they can't do nothing. That is, that is, I don't think that's what a constitution for us. A constitution is supposed to guide and guard, safeguard the people, and it should have either amendments or paradigm shift in that direction. With this, I take my leave, and I wish the best to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Mr. Jagatar. Thank you very much, sir. So you've been standing for a while. Good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Havel Woodruff, and I have been associated with different parts of this country for a large part of my 75 years. Um, what I was at UE in 1970, so uh, <clears throat> I was... I saw what was going on from the inside. 
We have said this afternoon that from 1962, we essentially have the same constitution with a few minor tweaks. And it is not because of lack of effort that we wanted to change the constitution. The situation has changed significantly and we still haven't got it done. When I heard about this meeting, I decided that I needed to be here. Because if we as a country have not been able to satisfactorily change our constitution, knowing that it needs change, then we have to look and see where else in the world constitutions have been changed satisfactorily or well. Recently, I saw uh, one or two reports about what was done in Singapore. And it might be instructive to look and see the hallmarks of their turnaround. Because back in the 1960s, I think that the, the earning power or the situation of the population there as well as here were of an order. However, today, Singapore is definitely what is considered a first world country. So it might be instructive to look and see what they did and whether we could use their ideas as a template for what we have in mind. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodruff. Uh, so just for one second, I believe this gentleman was using the seat just to be close to the microphone and in terms of order, would you mind if you just permit him for a sec? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening and welcome. <coughs> That's all right. That's okay. My name is Valmiki Ramsing. I represent the interests of the National Party, of which I'm political leader. I'd like Mr. Worship, good evening. Um, welcome, members of the NACCR, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have emailed this to you. It's a four-page document. I have been a student of the Constitution since 2018. And I have was part of the Pandey Committee that uh, was examining how best we could make this country livable for everyone without the extreme political bias that exists when governments take office. Of course, it forms the basis of further expansion and explanation in more detail for which we will make ourselves available. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, it's quite a bit because the Constitution is such a huge and important document. When something goes wrong, the first thing you do is you refer to is the law, the Constitution. What does it say? And this exercise is we are telling you all, this is what we want. And we want, the party has met quite a bit. Some of the ideas might be revolutionary, might even be rebellious, I don't know. But I will try as quickly as I can to run them through in bullet form because our governance structure needs to be remodeled, which calls for a radical change in the way we vote. So let us start with the EBC. The position of the chief election officer or the chairman of the EBC must not be a political decision. It simply is not right. It smells of bias. So we advocate that the appointment of the EBC chair and senior decision-making employees must not be a political decision, but subject to public scrutiny via publication in the media. The EBC chair and those employees must be selected by the Senate. Let us go to governance structure because I will be ahead of myself here. First of all, we advocate that there be no more prime minister. There be a president, and he will be in charge of his cabinet. We rename the entire system instead of parliament to the House of Representatives with a majority party and a minority party. 
we may need two days for elections because public vote for the president. Public vote for the president. You may put up who you want from your political party for the president, but the nation votes for its president. No more than two four-year terms for the president, president of the Senate, the DPP, the AG, the CJ, the Speaker of the HOR, House of Representatives, and the Chief of the EBC. The HOR Speaker should be a selected, elected by the Senate. The Senate is to consist of 15, no more. Those 15 people will be check and balance. So you can do what you want politically at the party in charge, but it gets to the Senate. They are the ones who are going to approve it, and they are the ones who are going to proclaim it, because we put them there collectively. There's no party involved here. Um, the judiciary needs to be remodeled for obvious reasons. We advocate that the law society associations elect the chief justice, the DPP, and all judges and other senior judicial officers. These appointments have to be reviewed every year by a subcommittee of the association and action taken to ensure that the purity of the judiciary is maintained. The necessary framework and bureaucratic infrastructure must be in place as dictated in the new Constitution of Trent Tobago. We come to a very important part in our deliberations with respect to the Constitution. We want to remove the scent of bias. We want to show that whatever it is, there is fair play and there is somewhere you can turn to. Hence, the Procurement Act, which was passed recently, that took seven years. In its original form, we liked it. In its present form, we didn't like it. The fact that one independent senator while voted while eight others abstained does not sit well with us. We are advocating the Contractor General. Who is the Contractor General? We have an Auditor General. We have a Solicitor General. We have a Registrar General. We have a Surgeon General. The Contractor General will have 15 assistants throughout the country in 15 different offices. Not one penny is going to be spent unless he or she approves it. So whatever regional corporation you belong to, whatever ministry you belong to, every contract, every dollar from the treasury has to be approved by the Contractor General. Now this is a big thing, eh? So I can flesh this out at any time you all want. I, we have an org organizational structure we've drawn up. We have a method of operation. We also have the legal. Now this is not brand new, you know. Jamaican practice is this. And I just came across in the um, 2013 publication of the UNC under the Ramada Commission, I came across this was mentioned that it should be looked after. I didn't know that. I thought I was being original and feeling good about myself. But that quickly died. The Contractor General will also be the final arbiter of the, 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 the High Commission, <laughs> the High Commission employees. Um, let me check and find that here quickly. All high commissioners and staff must be subject to public scrutiny and objection by a publication of selected candidates by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Contractor General will be the final arbiter of this. You cannot pack the high commissioner, high commission offices with people who simply are not qualified. Since the Contractor General is in charge of the post, basically, he must be the, he must be the final arbiter at his office. All board members who have been considered by the majority party must be published for scrutiny and objection by the public. The contractor general, i.e. the CG, will verify all qualifications and certifications. If objections are valid, those candidates must be rejected. The JLSC will be disbanded because the law association will fulfill the role of all judicial management. The JSC Joint Select Committee, must not continue to be anything more than an exercise and a, in interviewing people. The JSC must be empowered to act. Let me find that, please. Well, I wrote it, I suppose. No. The JSC must be empowered to act and be able to initiate legal proceedings against anyone 
they find in wanting or breach of public misbehavior in public office and, and public malfeasance. They must have that authority. The majority party will select their ministers. The AG will be selected by the majority leader. Local government, the entire body and its operation must be enshrined in the, con in the Constitution. The mayor of any city must be elected by public vote. I will still vote for you, don't worry. Registered by the registered voters of that city. Here's another important thing. All inquiries from the, to the FOIA must be answered regardless of the ministry within 30 days of submission. No longer should we, should we expect the excuse that this is national security. There's a cover of confidence there. The, we must know where our money is spending. And the contractor general adds to that on that level of where we have um, accountability. The constitution must also enshrine compulsory ministries of renewable energy and conservation, anti-discrimination, anti-corruption. I said this already, um, High Commissioner, the JLSC, I think that basically um, this covers more or less the, the key points that um, the citizen, citizenship court must be established, a gun court must be established, and a pet peeve of mine. The use of the word consultation is prevalent and very ambiguous in the present constitution. What authority or character does the word consultation have? Does it, have, does it mean discussion, approval, authority, information, debate? What does consultation mean? The Prime Minister in consultation will lead the opposition will appoint X, Y, and Z. What does that mean? Information? That be, what you're seeing there, and it's, it's in the Constitution, which I have a copy of, anybody want to see it, you know? Over and over and over, you see. So in reality, the Prime Minister of Trinidad Tobago has the power of veto on over 100 public service appointments. How could that be democracy? That has to be addressed. Legal people get to work. Um, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, that is basically um, trying to crystallize six years of work in four pages and five minutes. Thanks for the extra time, Mr. Wendell. Thank you, Mr. Ramsing. By chance, would you have a copy that the committee will have access to? I emailed this yesterday. Very well. Thank so you. they're supposed to be in the, the inbox. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And sir, thank you very much for uh, facilitating earlier. The microphone is all yours. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you very much. To the head table, good evening. And thanks for the opportunity for all of us to be able to make our voices heard. Um, the purpose of a constitution. I, may I have your name, please? Sorry, Seku Bastion is my name. Bastion. Right. Purpose of the constitution should be for a country to deal with the biggest threats that we face. Um, and in a fair manner, of course. And because I only have five minutes, um, I guess I'll have to use this picture here. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, this shows John Kerry signing the Paris climate agreement and you see he is signing it with his granddaughter there's another picture with him actually giving her a kiss so um, and so John Kerry thought it was that important that he should have his granddaughter there because of how big the threat was. The UN Secretary General said, he used the words, big trouble. Another time, he used the words, red alert. There was a NASA podcast um, that spoke about sea level rise accelerating. That was in September last year. 
John Kerry himself also tried to start an organization, and he called the organization World War Zero. And I, I, I guess I don't have to explain that name. Because that, that was the kind of effort that it would take to deal with this threat. Um, Vanuatu, which is a small country, a group of islands, um, they took a legal opinion to the International Criminal Court, International Criminal Court, um, seeking to find out if um, ecocide is their situation, meaning um, sea level rise is probably going to make their country non-existent in maybe 10, 15, 20 years, we don't know exactly. Um, and so whether ecocide, meaning genocide, because they're going to have to either move or they will be, they will die, basically. Tuvalu just decided, well, we wouldn't even bother with that um, because of the threat. So they made an agreement with Australia to have 280 of their young people go live, study, and work. I use those two examples because they are small islands, just like Trinidad and Tobago, small islands. So, that's the threat. So the Constitution should be able to deal with that threat. One of the ways I would suggest is that a climate committee be, fo be formed, and I would like to see that climate committee um, actually be part of the Constitution. Um, St. Lucia already has that climate committee and of course, it would be that the, there would be different um, parts of the government that would be part of that climate committee as well as other essential organizations. Um, one of the, the, free, the, the rights that the Constitution provides, speaks about, um, I'm sorry, it, I don't have the exact words, but it, it gave the, the idea that no authority can take your property. That, that was the basic idea. Um, and I would like to suggest that we investigate whether that, um, that right is really being implemented effectively and especially for those of us who are not, don't have our, um, don't have our pension as our salary, or, or, or our last salary as our pension. So last point, um, consider not just amendment, but also implementation. I think we, we always talk about amendment of the Constitution, but 
we never seem to talk too much about implementation. Is it really being implemented effectively? Um, I do have some other points that not relating to what I just spoke about, but um, if I have time later, I would I, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Bastian. Thank you. Just as a guide, we're heading up to 8 o'clock. It's already past 7.30. So as you make your way to the microphone, we kindly ask that you are as succinct as you humanly possibly can. So good evening and welcome. Good evening. My name is Jared Frederick. Good evening to the panel. Good evening to his worship. I want to address, now everybody's talking about the structure, but I want to address things that are already in the Constitution. The statutory bodies called service commissions. Currently, I'm an educator, so my direct service commission, the issue with us is that it is in charge of every appointment, every discipline motion, every promotion, every transfer of educators. They meet once a month. You cannot have efficiency with one body trying to do the work of 400 people to keep the, I wouldn't say ministry running, but the education system effective. Currently, we have members of the service who are retiring and have to wait up to four years to get, not their benefits, but the calculation for their benefits. Because after the measure of education attempts to quantify everything, everything has to go back to the commission for it to be verified by the commission's records. And there is not enough synchronization between the two bodies. I want to suggest that the, because when you ask what, why it happens, it said that the Constitution says that we have to meet once a month. However, could this be adjusted that we increase it to a minimum of twice a month and put a stipulation as necessary for the fun effective functioning of the teaching service? And I'm sure it's the same way with the other commissions, police service commission, um, the public service, fire services, and other commissions. The other thing are the accountants of the government, also known as permanent secretaries. They were given the power of not being able to be hired or fired to protect from political malfeasance. However, over the last 15 years, I've seen any time a permanent secretary stands on the rules that govern their ministry, two o'clock in the morning, you get that call, hey, we have a new problem sec. How in the world we have a new problem sec? I just went to meetings this morning. Well, that problem sec now over at social welfare as the second problem sec in social welfare. Okay, so who's the new problem sec? We got a new problem sec. Uh, is it the former um, deputy problem sec? No, they bring in a new problem sec. From where? We don't know. And then we have to now retrain this person in the rules and regulations of the teaching service, which falls under Chapter 39 of the Republican Constitution. And because there are persons who are in offices higher than me, these perm sex now rely on their advice, which many times are contrary to the Education Act, which is Chapter 39 of the Republican Constitution. And yet we have to have thousands of lawsuits every year over basic frivolous things because somebody comes in, decide, listen, when I was a teacher, we want the principals to do this, 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 they're not doing it. So new perm sec, give instructions. If they don't follow it, regulation 90 for everybody and they go through the process, because the commission meets once a month, there's no tribunal, people are suspended for years, there's no arbitration committee, 
you wait until almost dead it, um, time for retirement, and then you have, oh, great. They reviewed the case. You weren't wrong. Enjoy your retirement. These things must stop. We had those protections. Those protections are already written in. We just have to ensure that gov because there are cases currently before the courts where director of personnel from these commissions are saying, yes, the Constitution says this. However, in my humble opinion, we should not follow that. And matters are three and four years for a judge to decide, hey, you know what, the Republican Constitution is the highest law. After five years of deliberating, sure, let's go with what the Constitution says. And then money is to be paid out. The government challenges it in the appellate court, and that's the end of it. We have um, cases with teachers who won their cases, and we're still at the appellate court 15 plus years. Thank you for my time. Th thank you, sir. Thank you for your contribution. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Good evening to the panel, Your Worship, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Good evening, everybody. I think I think you can see me. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mikey Joseph, and I have no um, s uh, position in society except for being a guy who tried to be honest, and I've been observing Trinidad to be all my life, and there are a few things that I have a concern about. Um, I notice whenever we talk about uh, trying to effect a better constitution, we use the word reform. And I think that word reform frightens a lot of people. I think if we stick with simple things like amendments, and every year, every five years, every two years, we listen to what the people say, and we simply amend the constitution to deal with those things, we will probably will get more work done. But I think that this whole reform idea, it, it sounds a little bit too um, partisan in, in, in its intent. So maybe we should just try talking about amendments. Um, I just, there are just a few things that I've observed over my life that I think is holding our country back. And I am hoping that probably if I voice them here, you all might be able to um, have laws designed to deal with it. Yeah? I think that in the Houses of Parliament, we should separate the Senate and the MPs into two divisions. Have one look after our economy and money, and have the other one look after legislation as necessary to run the country, right? Which I think will be a more efficient use of time, and we'd be able to get a better um, streamline in terms of our economic vision of where we want to go and all of that. And um, I, I believe both MPs and senators should be elected under, probably at the same time, but under different um, rubric. Yeah? I also don't have a problem with an executive president, because I think it's time we just go forward. I've heard a lot of people speak about the time limits since I came. I was late. Sorry, I only found out about this through a message after inquiry this morning, and I was working, so I came straight from work. All right, so um, a, a lot of people speaking about the tenure, and yes, I, I think it's time we put uh, tenure on the terms uh, uh, for the president or the prime minister, whatever we may have, and I think we should also look at the leader of the opposition. Those three offices affect our lives. The governance of Trinidad and Tobago, as far as I'm concerned, combines the government, the administrators of government, and those in opposition. And I don't think anybody, the citizens, even understand the role they're supposed to play. If they do, the whole country would be in uproar with both sides in terms of the crime, instead of choosing sides. Because the government is to decide this is what is wrong, and the opposition is simply to verify if it is, and give support to measures that will bring solutions to the problem we face. 
It is not that it's PNM fault and UNC fault and ILP fault and whatever it is. It's a situation the country faces and the opposition and the government forms the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And they're both supposed to work to our benefit. So into that line, I think we should also have a timeline, a, 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 a tenure for the opposition leader. Um, also, uh, in many cases, we have politicians and public officers acting recklessly and causing a strain on the public purse, violating the laws and then people go to court and hefty um, uh, awards are made by, by the judiciary to which we the citizens have to pay. I think the constitution should look at where uh, public officers from, from the prime minister right down who act recklessly and cause the state to spend money and in so doing it should be compulsory that they pay at least 33% as compensation for their recklessness. Um, my, the speaker before me spoke about the independent bodies. We have some independent bodies in Trinidad and Tobago that are comes to no one. And uh, the limit of our thinking in Trinidad is that they are comes to nobody and nobody should ask them anything. So if the prime minister seek to get clarification or any other politician seek to get clarification from an independent body, it becomes a national crime. I think we don't need those independent bodies. Everybody with responsibility for any authority that deals with the function of office and department of state should be reporting at least quarterly to the president who would then lay that report in parliament. And they must be subject to verification by parliament and they should be made to appear in parliament to defend their positions if it is causing consternation in society. So my friend, the, the teacher would not be talking, and I know a lot of people who have that same problem where they retire, police officers take five, six years, some, in fact, some of them die before getting a pension because somebody somewhere in a commission is too important and meets 12 times a year to deal with the matter. So I think we need to look at those things. I think citizens should have the right to recall public officers who are elected. Because many times we elect people and they just don't work for our benefit. And we need to bring some type of order to this kind of thing. We the citizens need to stand firm and do not elect people and forget that they're there because we like them and they're from my church and from my tribe and all that nonsense. We elect people to be of service to us and if they're not cutting it, we should have the right to form a lobby, call and you cross a certain percentage, maybe 65% of the constituency, at 65% of the votes, and once that is achieved, they have to leave. Call a by-election. I have a problem with people being deprived of their resources, their property, without due process. And I'm talking now about the banking sector. You would have money in your US account and you want to go and make a withdrawal because you have a bill to pay or you, have, you wish to travel and the bank will tell you you can't get more than $200 while you have thousands of dollars in your account, on your US account. I think the laws that govern banking need to be revised and I think people should have full access at all times to their money, their property that is not under any legal um, restriction. Because the law said you should have full enjoyment of property except where due process determines that you might have committed a crime and not entitled to. And last but not least, I had the benefit of being maligned innocently and uh, had my name pulled for the mud by parliamentarians. I would like to have a mechanism governing parliament that when a citizen 
is um, defamed or suffers some type of injustice through any inaccurate information laid in parliament by politicians who will now enjoy freedom or pr of privilege, that citizen should have an, a, a, an um, access to redress. Because I personally did not like it. That hurt me for years. And I don't think any citizen should suffer that. Right? As I said, I'm just a simple citizen living here for all of my life. And these are the things I observe that I'm not happy with. The other things, I leave it to you guys with all your legal brains and everything. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. We are nearing the end. So I would just advise that we can facilitate, I believe, two more presentations. This lady has been standing for quite some time. Ma'am, the microphone is all yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really just a commentary and a, a different perspective that I wanted to bring. I'll try to be brief. Um, my name is Trisha Andrew. Um, I'm an energy professional. And it's just interesting how small this gathering is, but I suspect there's so, much, so many more persons and opinions represented. One of the things that struck, um, and I've been a, an energy professional for the far, past 25 years, by the way. So um, as a taxpayer, as Mr. Joseph, humble taxpayer, who probably has paid more tax than probably many of you on the esteemed table, um, by virtue of my tax bracket, which I would never recall, um, I, uh, I support uh, the, some of the preceding comments of that gap, addressing the gap between your last salary and your pensionable age. That seriously has to be rectified um, through constitutional and other means. Um, it is a profound disservice and a direct promotion of inequity, um, which essentially is, is legalized um, to be able to promote that. And that, of course, devolves to the National Insurance Act and all these, those other related institutions. To be able to allow hemorrhaging of funds of the state in such a way that you no longer can provide for future generations securely is a travesty of stewardship um, of those of the funds given to us. I work in a public private company and were I to do that, my pink slip will be already um, issued to me with um, legal entities. We talk about first world, and I think the state, the government, constitution has to be looked at as uh, it, from a parental or even nurturing form. We try to talk and impose and legalize morality. We can't do that. Um, if you leave morality to the lawyers or to the legal institutions, it will always break down. The issue, too, is how we approach constitution. If constitution is supposed to be the framework in which we develop, my, is, my main, I suggest that we approach it from a consequence management perspective as well. When we want to talk about the crime and the issues, part of it is when we look at the current constitution while it proved to hold up for 50 years, which is almost as old as I am. Um, it means some things worked, and that is fabulous. But we don't throw the baby out with the bath water. And what we are identifying, and some of the comments here, seems to all point to consequence management. Just like your HR policy in a company, it tells us the guidelines. But do have we enough rubric in the Constitution for all the comments mentioned of what happens when this is not in place. What happens when we fail to steward our environment? And I just bring that up as a point to be included because we should be aware of the landmark case recently awarded, I believe, is Sweden, right? To aged persons who, similar to tax, 
contributed to the state and hold the state accountable for directly contravening environmental equity to diminish their quality of life. So a modern constitution for the 2020s, 2030s demands a consideration of all the existing tax, but environmental consequence and inequity, special abilities in equity and construct, and, and, and actions towards same, even information and AI. We have, our institution was, constitution was crafted um, at a time when the, mo the morality of the society was more homogenic, yes? And it has evolved. It needs to be relevant to modern world. We are now seeing things which we think are scandalous geopolitically. When we craft the constitution, is there enough diversity in the architect to anticipate what? a 50, 40, 30, 20 year old person is going to inherit by our actions. And that brings me to, I know this is just, I know this is the um, part of the panel, the representative panel, diversity even in the construct. I was hoping to see somebody my age, <laughs> you know, as part of the panel. We, I, my contemporaries are going to inherit the policies being crafted. Where is my voice? Where are our, where are those younger than I? Um, and I do hope that because you are just a core, that your network is going to tap into those voices who are going to hold us and you, the framers or the reporters, accountable for the representativeness of your consultation. So with that in mind, I wanted to just bring those comments to the fore. Um, I volunteer in any way because I think I, I think I and my generation after me are going to inherit <laughs> the consequences of this. So to the esteemed panel and to um, the audience, thank you for hearing my humble voice. Thank you, Ms. Andrew. If we, if we may, for one minute, uh, but sir, I'm, re I'm recognizing you, but just to allow the gentleman to make his point, please. Yes, sir. Sorry, we'd like to hear you, please. I, I spoke first to Ellie and come here to listen and so on. And I, I think from what I have seen, I think there are certain structures here that if we... Um, if we change them, we get better outcomes. And I think the first thing is, is the speaking arrangement, the physical speaking arrangement. Where you sit, where you speak from, is where the speaker should speak from. You just, see, you just look at it and you see how hard it, hard it is. Everybody's looking back at the, at the speaker. Uh, you know, the speaker should face the audience. First of all, this is a conversation with citizens. You're more like a secretariat, right? And therefore, the speaker should face the audience, first thing. The second thing is, <coughs> given the um, response we have here from people and from the turnout to the meeting, it seems the time limit, is not, not the time limit to speak, but the time for the meeting is too short. And if you can't be here more than two and a half hours, then we shall have more than one session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. I'd just like to advise with the chairman's guidance, uh, he has permitted and guided that we can facilitate a few more contributions. So if we have to go up to just about 825, we may, thanks to the committee. Uh, so you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you for your patience. Go right ahead. No problem. I'm from San Fernando. Good evening to the, to the panel, to the, to the commissioners. Uh, my name is Olin Bedo. I am just a plain and simple plebeian from Coquille. In other words, a man of the, of the street, of the rum shop, of the market. Um, first of all, I, should, I would like to say welcome 
to you all, to San Fernando, which is the oldest non-interrupted municipal body in Trinidad. Port of Spain, of course, had a, an interruption by Mr. Chamberlain. And um, I will say thank you for, for welcome to San Fernando. I hope that, um, I don't know how you passed to come here. I don't know if you passed through Cookie, and you might have seen some of our, our garbage, bulk garbage, I see the mayor is here. Got bulk, bulk garbage piled up there since Christmas. Um, but this is one of the things that we get in, in local government, which is one of the things I think should we should see being discussed in terms of the consultation, a consultation for, um, not a consultation, discussion on our constitution. <coughs> um, just by coincidence, today happens to be, I think, the anniversary of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865, the man who gave us what government by the people, for the people, and of the people. It's just a, a coincidence that um, you might want to take in, into account. Now, in terms of this um, consultation reform or amendment or revision, whatever it is, we haven't got it, got it clear, but I came here because of the advert in the paper is saying to come and just give your views on constitutional reform. They didn't say on reforming the constitution. So it's quite open to really say anything about constitutional reform. But I would just like to say one, uh, one or two little things, and that is <coughs> that perhaps, well, first of all, no constitution can be reformed or amended or whatever without the fiat of the government of the day, that is the prime minister. So if you get to bear that in mind, what do we do? And that is why we found, I think, um, Dr. Farrell, I'm not sure if you mentioned in your recap of the various attempts at constitutional reform that um, what happened to Mr. The, the Winning Commission when after he did it, Williams took the floor. How much, Mr. Mr. Mohammed? Six hours in Parliament and scrapped some of the most important um, recommendations that the Winning Commission made. So after all that was said and done, the key areas and which everybody talks about something Mr. Pandey did, it's a proportional representation and so on. Williams took for six hours or something like that and scrapped it. And that gives, an, gives us an idea of how the constitutional reform will go without the government of the day being interested in it. Now, we have this going on, and I would really like to see it a success. I wouldn't see any part of it, you see, at my age. But nevertheless, we'd like to see something come out of it. So... <clears throat> I would like to think that with no, um, all, res all due respects to the, pa to, the, to the commissioners, that we probably need to make change the approach. I see one or two people did comment on it. I think Ashton Britton did that. And I see Professor Kojo made something of it. And of course, members of, of, um, of the opposition have talked about um, the whole, this whole exercise being a puppy show. I won't go that far. But a lot of things in Trinidad are the puppy show, including many of the consultations we have. So I would like to suggest that perhaps there's still time to change the approach a bit. And if I may, I would say that um, in this we could look at, at this part of it as, or the early part of it, as a brainstorming exercise. Not the sort of thing I have seen people in, in other places, uh, when these kind of cons these, these um, meetings come and give a long, erudite discussion about this, that, and the other. I think at this stage, what can you expect from, from an ordinary plebeian like me to do anything that could make an impression anyway, other than a little brainstorming bit and talk about some um, transactional thing that I feel the Constitution needs to look at. Um, I think in terms of, of that, we could probably look at the um, constitutions and bring out to people a philosophy and principles of 
our constitution in Trinidad. I don't think we have that. But I know that various constitutions, I know I've read it someplace, will talk about a philosophy that informs the constitution or that emerges from what in the constitution. I certainly know that in the Indian constitution, we talk about the directive. That's a directive constitution. And um, I think the American constitution, they say the philosophy is certainly the, the supremacy of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the law and the judiciary. I think that's it. But various other constitutions, you, you have a, a philosophy that informs it. And we could look at that, and that could guide us, people like me, PBNs and Ramshaw people like me, to be able to do something and say something about the Constitution. Um, that, that should help. Um, I think to, uh, let's see, let's see, so I just jotted down something because I didn't come for that today. All right. Now, I believe that um, Constitution reform, amendment, that's a big thing. It's a big, big thing. I mean, well, ours, our Constitution is much bigger than the American Constitution. We like, to, we like to talk about the American Constitution and things in America. But if you remember that, the American Constitution is tiny compared to our Constitution here. And we like to also refer to Britain. Britain doesn't have a, have a written Constitution. But therefore, all the laws will technically form part of the, their constitution. So we cannot do this thing. I don't mean to, to complain about the five minutes, because obviously five minutes is, is only to brainstorm and say something. So we have to look for a different kind of mechanism to get some views of people like me, who may have a view, but not going to be able to influence you very much. So I think we ought to. We need to look at this in a somewhat different way, where you can have discussions with people. Not big discussions, not big crowds, but you need to have some kind of close, um, what I would say, uh, collegial kind of discussion, you see, where we can interact and exchange views. Um, I would say, just quickly, this, there are one or two little things that probably have to help and make some meaning to me. And therefore, what, what, we, what we would appreciate, I would appreciate, I would have expected, the Constitution can be changed without, the, with, without the, 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 the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, therefore, you have to presume he wants, or pre wants to pretend that he wants a Constitution change or amendment. And therefore, it's up to him and the government to give us something to work on. Give us something, something like a, a background paper saying why, what, is, what, what, what are the areas of difficulty with the Constitution, what are the desirable areas we need to look at, and give that to give us something to buy it on. Other than that, all this exercise is only not for small people like me, but maybe for the intellectuals and so on, who have no problem in any case to get their views across. So I would say that we need something like that. And again, too, um, just for some items that, that we need to, to, to discuss, will come out eventually. One is Tobago. We can't discuss constitutional reform unless we talk about Tobago. And from Tobago, it, I will also get around to talk about local government. I know the, I know the, I know the, 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 the justices said recently that Tobago is not part, I'm sorry, Local government is not part of the Constitution. That might be true, but it might be so in the written thing. But, but the local government should be very, very much part into our DNA. And, our, into our, and you talk about England, you could, England without a Constitution, would you change anything for, the, for, for local government in England? No, 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 might, might, no Constitution. And certainly in terms of um, the city of London, that bit of local government, ah. So I think we need to look anything um, in what I suppose the government will put out for us to take a bite on. We must have something about Tobago. I would like to see, too, in it, a question of communication and access generally to the politicians. Somewhere along the line, 
we need to have this, that we can have greater access and communication with them. Um, I think it is worthwhile for you all, for you all now, but also whichever paper coming out, that we re, re have a look again and examine and tease out the preamble to the Constitution. There are some things here that we need to look at, and also the, the semi-preambles, because there are things that take very big, great prominence, like the, all the preambles to the, what? Um, what is it? it the, the, all the papers, the, what? The vision, vision, vision 2030 and Vision 2020, we should look at some of those things again that they take for granted. But you say, where was we are so and so and so and so? And you say, but well, that that's not where I live in. That's not for me, and so on. And I would say this much now. And I'll leave it like that because there's so much more we can, we can do, talk. And that is, that word tolerate. That word tolerate. That's a, that, to my mind, is a, it presumes and assumes, especially for people like me who live in the nether regions of the geopolitical part of Trinidad, south of Kearney. And that is, tolerate presumes that there is a superior dominant group there, whatever you do. So I just use that word to say, the way we say, we assume that that is so, that is, that is Eric Williams, um, part of the slogan for us. So I think some things like that we need to look at. And I believe it like that because there's so much more. And my five minutes would have gone about 15 times already. So I just say, I'll bring this up because I came here and you all came from wherever you are. I'm not talking about Nizam. <laughs> oh, oh, Barry, Barry, oh, Mr. and there. Oh, so I say, I'll, I'll leave it like that. And that's so, like I tell people, I just hope to chuck you in one of these areas and give some room for thought. Thank you very, very much. And welcome again to San Fernando. And those who are not from San Fernando, have a good trip wherever you came from. Thank you, Mr. Oh, you're not Bedo. Going to tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bedo. Appreciate it, sir. Uh, sir, you were waiting. There are two gentlemen, gentlemen, and this gentleman who's standing, yes, by all means, go right ahead. And the gentleman that's immediately to your <laughs> right, uh, sir, you will be able to oblige right after. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raleigh Dominic Hussein, a citizen of the southern city. And I must say that I found out about this consultation here just by the way, an hour before it occurred. But I interacted on the social media pages to find out when will San Fernando get this opportunity? When would San Fernando get this opportunity? And I kept messaging the page with their beautiful social media presence and to no avail. And we question, where's the youth voice? My dear lady uh, citizen here who shared and asked where is the youth voice. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but those who are not here because of work obligations, how many under 45 is seated here and giving a contribution? Don't show no hands. Just questioning. You see, what is happening is we need to, to make sure that our focus is true and all inclusive and embracing, and it goes beyond the paraphernalia that we use to really use as window dressing. So we have someone that looks down syndrome, we have the children, but where are the voices? I hope you'll be coming to the University of Trinidad and Tobago and make all arrangements to you beautiful people that sits on this committee to come by to the University of Trinidad and Tobago. We have eight campuses right here in Trinidad. We have one in Tobago, and we can hear the voice of the youth, voice of the people under age 50 who will be directly affected by this constitution if or when it ever comes to pass, because we are seeing the timeline. And then we can go to the University of the West Indies, and we have other colleges where the young people can give their voices. So please, let's have a forum, a couple of interactive sessions, 
I will be delighted to be a part of that because I sat with my students earlier this semester and we gave three points in writing because I made it a class discussion. I asked a simple question. What do you want to see as a young person, 20, 22 years old, be a part of the law? Guess what they said? That camouflage thing had to go out the door, sir. To sum it may be the most foolish thing to say, but you know what? It is what mattered to them. Is the present constitution being taught as a general knowledge topic? We had people raising matters of, of teaching service commission. Where are we going with educating? What does the constitution say about the present constitution and that which we are looking forward to say about the content in our curriculum? We as educators, and I speak as an educator for the past two decades, we have many challenges. A simple thing as explaining to some of my students the other day about, so this, this man who was the chief justice, he was also a judge for a Caribbean court. We have a Caribbean court. And I said, yes, we have a Caribbean court of justice right here in Port of Spain. And then the question came, so Trinidad, that's a part of that. We sang here at five o'clock, this our native land, we pledge our lives to thee. We did not sing, God save the king. I am hoping that these proposals that people are giving, and I know on many of the different cons um, consultations we had, we have to subscribe and we have to give that support to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Are we still pledging allegiance to England? Or are we not willing to truly manage ourselves? Are we afraid of managing ourselves? Because bribes and all of these handshakes can go on. Are we not saying that we can do it? My three points in summary. Youthful representation, and this is a suggestion to the committee, not much the constitutional reform. We need to do more to get this activity appealing to the young people of our country. We need to go in to the schools, we need to go into the universities, the colleges, we need to get them, because they need to know that their voice, they need to know they have a voice. Don't tell me nothing about accessibility. The amount of people we have on social media, they're accessing, they have devices. We need to ensure that they use the devices in the way that could construct and build our society. Nobody can bring for me data up to now about they don't have access. They have access. Every week, Digicel and the mobile giving free phones or phones on plans, they have access, more access than you think. Anything wrong happen, a phone is going up, so they have access. Let's help them to access you. Because this constitution is going to take, just as my dear lady citizen said, it's going to impact and affect those that's coming up. Say again? And, and, and those are questions for they to be answering but my second point just want to reiterate right that we need to ensure that education is addressed education in all forms so i am very very happy to be here and be a part of this i'm very happy to be a part and given the opportunity so thank you very much sir sir let's maintain the order sir no, let's maintain the order. Let's maintain the order. Because we in San Fernando love order and decency, unless it's Skinner's Park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hossein. Good evening and welcome.
Good evening and welcome. Go right ahead. Right, yes. Thank you, sir. My name is Maxime Quintal. I'm a San Fernandian. I have six recommendations for the committee. First, abolition of the Privy Council as a final court of appeal. It has become patently clear in recent years that the law lords of the, ju the Judicial Committee have been out of touch with the politics, socio-economic conditions, and aspirations of Caribbean peoples. The time has now come for all English-speaking Caribbean nations to fully support the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final court of appeal. To this end, the people of this country should decide by way of referendum. Second point, the president of, the Trinidad, and, of Trinidad and Tobago should be elected by the people. The ele electoral college should be scrapped Nominees to this office should automatically come from political parties which had garnered 10% of the votes cast in the preceding general elections. Any other candidate vying for this office should be able to obtain 1,000 bona fide signatures of persons who had voted in the last elections and should pay a non-refundable sum of 10,000 Trinidad and Tobago dollars in the Treasury. The people should decide this proposal by way of referendum. Third point. All persons nominated to offices under the Constitution must be approved by the House of Senate. In other words, the Attorney General, the Ombudsman, the Director of Public Prosecutions, they should all become before the House of Senate and prove they are fit for office in our Parliament. Fourth point, mayors in the various jurisdictions should be elected by the people in their respective corporations. Nominees to this office should automatically come from political parties which had garnered 10% of the votes cast in the preceding elections. Any other person vying for this office should make a non-refundable sum of $5,000 into the Treasury. To be eligible to run for this office, the candidate must be a resident of the respective district. Fifth point, establishment of an ethics violation committee in the Senate to investigate all ethical violations by government ministers and other bodies against citizens, groups, associations, businesses, etc. This committee should be chaired by an independent senator and should be comprised of three other senators appointed by the president. The committee should have subpoena powers. The entire House should debate any motion put to it by the committee. This proposal is crucial given the recent COVID experience where mandates were given which may have violated citizens' rights. Certain things were put in the arms of people and they don't know up to this time, what it is when there. Mandates were given that vaccines should be given to children and that it should also be compulsory. To date, no parliamentary sitting has been done to talk about COVID. Six points. Transferring the authority to issue firearms license to citizens from the should be removed. 
this authority should be removed from the police commissioner to the minister of national security. The majority of our citizens believe that their right to life, liberty, security, and, employ and enjoyment of property has been eroded by the inability of the police service to contain the criminal element of the country. As a consequence, they feel exposed to this element since their perception is that the police are unable to protect them and their family. In spite of the invulnerability of citizens to vicious criminal activity, there seems to be an unwillingness of the powers that be to open up the system that would give citizens the wherewithal to protect themselves. If ever there was a time for citizens to have access to firearms to protect their families, that time is now. This is especially required where citizens feel vulnerable in certain areas of the country. It is to be noted, however, that the TTPS, which is a sole authority to issue firearm licenses, is the very same authority which has failed abysmally to provide security and safety to the nation. It is therefore more than time that this responsibility be transferred to another. The usual controls should still be in place to guarantee the integrity of the process. But the average citizen who wish to possess a firearm to protect his family should not be treated as though he needs to be protected from himself. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Quintel. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, um, sir, we are about to wrap, but I'll give you the opportunity just to be brief, but make your point. Go right ahead. I am in favor of having a Caribbean court. There was a, there was a, Mr. Bastian. My name is Sekou Bastian. Um, I am in favor of a Caribbean court. There was a concern, however, about the structure of the court and the funding, and there was an article in the paper some years ago. Um, we want a court, a Caribbean court, that is will be, it will be very difficult to influence those who are making the decisions. And I would like to hope that if we eventually do get this Caribbean Court of Justice in Trinidad and Tobago as our final court, that there will be steps made to strengthen that aspect that those who can influence the decisions, and we know that there are some quite powerful people who can influence those decisions, that um, that is dealt with. Um, so that's one point. Um, my main point, teaching service and auditor general. Um, it is in the Constitution. I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if there were resources allocated to those bodies, all the service commissions, and um, the teaching service commission, every so often there's a delegation order to the Ministry of Education so that some duty that the Teaching Service Commission had is now passed to the Ministry of Education. So the Teaching Service Commission is slowly being weakened 
we know that there was a public official at a consultation and education who spoke about the Teaching Service Commission trying to get rid of it. I want to remind us what the purpose of the Teaching Service Commission and all the service commissions are that it was to protect um, employees from political interference, public servants. And so I would like to please um, beg that that be remembered, that be kept in mind, that be taken into consideration before doing what that public official may have wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bastian. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we pause at this time uh, in appreciation of the contributions made by uh, the citizens of uh, the lovely city of San Fernando and the immediate environs, including Point Fortin. I also want to acknowledge, of course, Deputy Mayor Patricia Alexis for being with us this evening. Yeah. Councillor Lynch, as well as Councillor Hussein for being with us this evening. Thank you very much, Mayor, for advising me accordingly. Ladies and gentlemen, also, uh, in the midst of the points that were made just a short while ago uh, with respect to consultations for uh, young citizens of Trinidad and Tobago or those who are categorized as the youth of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the committee proposes three of these youth fora, and in fact, they are being planned in consultation with youth leaders in Trinidad and in Tobago. I believe that the feedback has to come from those who are part of the youth movement in order to structure the engagement according to the feedback from the young citizens of our country. So naturally, it will take on a different climate and, and order to how these activities have been conducted, which has really been, for want of a better word, listening to the wisdom of those who have been through many of the decades of our society in a manner that allows you to be unfettered and therefore able to allow young persons as well to make their contribution in their unfettered environment. Further, if it may not have been shared before or it was not uh, made abundantly clear, there is the intention that upon the receipt of the recommendations and feedback from all of these uh, consultations of the convening of a national constitutional conference and consultation in June 2024. So this is perhaps chapter one, or as Mr. Bedo said, preamble. So we're in one phase, there are more to come. Uh, permit me at this time with the microphone on at the table to allow to move the vote of thanks, no stranger to San Fernando, of course. Uh, of course, former um, uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives and Attorney at Law, please welcome to move the vote of thanks, Mr. Nizam Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. His Worship, the Mayor of San Fernando, Councillors, my dear friends, the contributions that we have had here tonight, from my perspective, I would describe as befitting the talent that we have in San Fernando. This has been such a wonderful, this has been such a wonderful and informative exercise. And uh, to be headed by our mayor adds prestige and meaning to what we are doing. And every single contribution that has been made, I can tell you, we are taking note of your contributions. Dr. Terence Farrell outlined to us 
that we are collating all that we are obtaining from the public and we will ensure that this gets to um, the authorities working towards this national convention sometime in June. I have said this, I have made this remark before. We're getting to the meat of the matter. We're getting to the marrow of the matter in a previous gathering like this. And that came to my mind again when, and I hope I have the name correct, you will forgive me, when Mr. Raleigh Cummings was talking and he was asking, where are the voices? Where are the voices? And I said, you know, he was actually putting the icing on the cake. And it is a valid question that he has raised. A late great friend of mine and one of my mentors, Lloyd Best, years ago, used to be telling us, listen, it is time that we take up our bed and walk. It is time that we take up our bed and walk. And he was talking to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But because of what Dr. Farrell has said, we were handed down something from um, 41962 as a transition that has become permanent. Gypsy Peters in Rio Claro, he says, I want to see a constitution. Who are we must be reflected in a constitution. Where have we come from? Where are we going? This has to be reflected in a constitution. And I said, we're getting into the meat of the matter. Brothers and sisters, I am passionate about this exercise that we have undertaken. And I want to tell you that no formula will be perfect as you would want it to be perfect. But we have made a start and we can make it happen. But I tell you, constitutions are never made to suit any political party. Constitutions are produced by its people for its people. And we are the ones to make it happen, not eight individuals who have been chosen. Use us and let us make the start. And let us get on with the exercise. And this is not about political partisanship. This is not about that. There is an, a political ideology that is taking, has taken root in Trinidad and Tobago. And their manifesto and their ideology is guns, violence, mayhem, total chaos. And if we do not have a legal framework with the foundation of a constitution to avoid that, then we are going to be in deeper trouble. Aren't we seeing what is happening? Tell our friends and our families, listen, we can criticize, we, are, have, a, we have a right. We have a right to look at each other in critical ways. But we also have a responsibility to band ourselves together. You know, when our, our, our dear friend, uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm missing it. Mikey Joseph was saying, he said, there are certain things, people talking about this, that, and the other, put these, th th these things are aside and let us see ourselves as one people. So I want to thank the mayor for gracing us with his presence. I want to tell him that he can be a leader for the propagation and the exchange of ideas so that we can reintroduce something called civics in the schools in Trinidad and Tobago. That ha is not happening anymore. That is why you see our, the naysayers are taking advantage of a situation. They know that the people, a lot of people, don't understand 
about the critical importance of a constitution that is operational, beneficial, and allowing for each one of us to have our place and our space together as one people. We can work towards that. My friend Matthews, Mickey Matthews, he wants for us to talk more. And all of this is possible. It is just that we have a limited time, but we can build on what, um, what we are doing at the head table here. So my dear friends, I want to thank each and every one of you. And I cannot find the words to tell you how much we appreciate the manner in which you have conducted yourselves here. It shows that we have the capacity. It shows that we have the capability. So thank you again on behalf of my colleagues. I want to thank the gentleman who, um, who has been our moderator. You know why we have a moderator? It is interesting to know why we have one. We are not guiding any meeting in any direction. We are here to listen to you and to seek verification and clarification if necessary and take what you bring to us to the authorities according to our mandate as outlined by Dr. Terence Farrell. And that is what we are doing. And I want to thank you for your help. I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for your contribution. And I want you to stand up for the Constitution Review Committee, however you interpret it. Stand up for it and let us make something meaningful happen for Trinidad and Tobago. Safe journey home. God bless each and every one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohammed. As we're about to close, ladies and gentlemen, just a, a few remarks. Thanks again, once again, to His Worship, the Mayor, the Councillors, and all of the City Corporation for facilitating this evening's meeting. The next engagement is in Princess Town on Wednesday, and this will be followed by Arima on Friday before we go to Tobago West next Monday and, of course, the rest that I would have shared uh, previously. Moreover, as you return safely to your homes tonight, if by chance there's a relative or a friend that asks you in true Trini manner, where are you now coming from? The answer would be, you went somewhere to plan the future of your country because that's what this is. As small as a mustard seed as it may be, as basic as it may appear, without the bright lights and the cameras, by the way, the Parliament channel is here, and thanks to the Parliament team, all that's being recorded eventually has to be used, not just for the record, but to be printed and posted on the record. Moreover, it is these small mustard seeds, these David versus Goliath moments that actually make the difference. Difference does not come with war and noise and bombs and guns. Like a thief in the night, gentle, peaceful, calm, with a spirit of unity and togetherness. It's been a privilege being asked to serve the committee in this capacity. I have a few more to do. My job is simply to keep you on time. So there is absolutely no malice or ill intent in my demeanor or my conduct. I have a job to do. May God bless you all. May God bless our nation. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>